Good afternoon and welcome to the first uh, town hall of, uh, by the Ocean Elders on uh, the topic of seabed mining, a important new sector that it's important to, to understand. Um, first, I hope that you're all um, staying well and safe uh, during this, this uh, COVID-19 uh, situation. And uh, the purpose of today's discussion is really to understand um, what's going on in the deep oceans and some of the other big topics that will be um, we'll be facing the next few few uh, weeks and months. Um, seabed mining is a topic that's been uh, emerging for the last uh, several years and in less than three months time a body of the United Nations will be taking a vote at the end of July to, uh, to, to decide on whether we should be allowing commercial uh, scale seabed mining. Scientists around the world are concerned if we just look at the um, scale of the machines that we're talking about <laughs> These are machines that you can see in green, the size of a, a, a human. These are machines that will be used to extract um, nodules at the bottom of the seabed, um, take out hydrothermal vents, which could be as large as uh, 10 story buildings, where life was only just discovered uh, four decades ago in 1977. So this will have very profound implications for, uh, for the planet. As already an area, uh, about 6% the, the surface area of the moon has already been licensed to seabed mining companies. And over here, we see the sense of scale in the Pacific Ocean on the left, Hawaii, on the right, uh, the Mexican coast. Uh, so this is as wide as the continental US, where 30 contractors already have licenses and are awaiting this decision by the International Seabed Authority in three months time. Um, and the reason why we're starting with this region, which we call the Clariton -Clipperton, Clarion Clipperton zone, is because of the moral hazard um, or that will be created around the world. We already see around the world countries like, um, uh, like Papua New Guinea, Mexico, New Zealand, and across the Pacific, on the Western Pacific, in the Indian Ocean where the hydrothermal vents are, the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic just outside of Brazil. There in the Cook Islands, as larger an area as the Clarion Clipton Zone is being considered for nodules. Again, in Scotland, where they've been dredging to create new, um, new wind farms using the same types of technology. So these technologies, you know, we can now go down to the depth of the ocean, but should we go, be going down to the depth of the ocean and in Japan and Namibia? Um, so what we are seeing here is going to create important new precedents for the world. Um, and there've been exaggerated claims made by some of the seabed mining companies and the seabed mining industries that these minerals are essential in order to meet our commitments for the Paris Agreement and for climate change. And so these are minerals that are being demanded for consumer electronics and for electric vehicle batteries. And we'll be tackling that issue in subsequent uh, webinars that Ocean Elders will be holding. So with that and that context, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Liz Taylor and Dr. Sylvia Earle, who I'm sure most of you do not need uh, an uh, introduction to. And they are marine scientists who have been to some of the um, depths of the ocean around the world and seen and experience um, what life is like deep, deep at the uh, bottom of the ocean. So first, welcome, both of you. Thank you. Great to be on board. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Liz, Sylvia, perhaps you can start by just uh, sharing with us, with us, what's it like at the bottom of the ocean? What is that experience like as you, you descend? How deep does it feel? And what do you see when you're down there? Well, you know, it takes, it takes quite a few hours, really, to get down to some of these areas, particularly here at the uh, Clarion Clipperton Ridge Zone. We can be doing descent from the time that we launched the ROV system. Um, you know, we're watching our video here of an expedition that we undertook in uh, 2018 with the University of Hawaii and the ROV system Mulukai, which can get down to a depth of uh, 6,000 meters. And you can see this is a, an area that's just abundant in life. Um, I'll let you yeah. talk further about some of these little guys we're seeing here. Most of what we're finding has not been seen by humans, at least. It's, it's just a, almost a miracle that these things exist <laughs> at all. Uh, we're, we're experiencing this dive with you vicariously, looking at film. But to get in a little submarine and start in blue clear water above where, where a lot of the action is with photosynthesis, where the little green guys generate oxygen and take up carbon, and here in the Clarion Clipperton zone, it happens at the surface as well as in seeing at the great depths, there's life all the way down. That's the thing. Even in the deepest ocean, life occurs. It's dark down there, except for the lights 
of the lulakai that you see illuminating the area. Well, here with very thoughtful, gentle movements to try to disturb the seafloor in the least way to selectively sample some of the life there. So we know who they are. We just don't know. Almost everything down there is being witnessed for the first time. There is the illusion that the deep sea is uniform and what you find in one place you'll find everywhere. Well, here a brittle star is glommed onto a manganese nodule. These look like stones, like dead stones. <laughs> galloping sea urchin. Galloping sea urchin is right. <laughs> Some things get up and move around all right, but many of the others are just... So Sylvia, just, just on that as we see, I mean, these creatures, when I look at this, how is this different from life on the surface? Because I imagine there's no oxygen, there's no light, there's no photosynthesis. So how is this different from what we see on, on the surface? There's oxygen, just not much of it. <laughs> Free oxygen, that is. Uh, the vertebrates, such as this fish, gets oxygen from the seawater, but there, there isn't a lot as compared to what's at the surface. And the, the key factor is that there's no light except for bioluminescence. There are creatures that flash and sparkle and glow, but not enough to provoke the magic of photosynthesis. These creatures thrive in part on the rain of organisms, of detritus, of the organic matter that comes from the surface, from the sunlit portion that only extends down, oh goodness, maybe 300 meters, a bit more sometimes. And how deep are we looking at, uh, how, how deep is this, this area here that we're looking at? 5,000. We're four to 5,000 meters uh, over most yeah. of this. It's dark. It's really dark. Here's the one that people are just uh, calling the onion ring. <laughs> <laughs> we have no idea. <laughs> yeah, who are you? What are you? What are you? But you can see how carefully the ROV is picking it up and bringing it across into right. the drawer. For, right. Try to figure it out. But this, this sampling, as compared to the approach that's used with a, when they're actually out to tear up the ocean floor and gather those nodules or the crusts or whatever it is the that are. The, the mining operations are targeting. In the clarion Clipperton zone, it's, it's about the nodules. Then it's, <laughs> there's a fish known as a hokey, a rat tail. You might find it in your Donald McDonald's fish sandwich. <laughs> Those creatures are being mined from the ocean as well. Uh, we, we know so little about who they are and how their role in terms of the chemistry of the planet. The, the carbon cycle is a, a, a really something that, well, this instrument, among others, the deep uh, seafloor lander, mm -hmm. looking at water chemistry and trying to use the capacity that we now have to not only ask questions, to get some answers to the questions. We really don't know the, the answers to the big issues of what's in the deep sea or why it matters. All we are looking at with the deep sea mining issue is looking at the metals, but the value of what's there, from the microbes to the sea cucumbers, through that dancing little urchin, they may be far more valuable, far more important than all of the metals that can be extracted from these, these things. You know, I think sometimes we're a bit like a Neanderthal who's come across a big computer what do you do with it? Do you eat it? Do you use it as a tool to smash a coconut? You know, we're, we're not thinking with the kind of intelligence that I'd like to believe that we really have. We should treat the deep sea with the utmost respect and figure out what's going on down there. Who are these creatures? How do their lives impact ours? We know how ours impact theirs. We're all connected. That's one thing that we do know at this point in time. <laughs> we don't need a coronavirus to make it clear that all life on Earth exists in this miracle of a small blue planet in the midst of a lot of hostile places out there. And, and what we already have done to the natural world has unleashed some real problems like the climate change issue, changing the temperature, but changing the chemistry as we disrupt 
these old systems, whether it's on the land in old growth forests or now targeting the deep sea, why, why can't we look with fresh eyes and say, maybe having a place for sharks and these other creatures is, is more important than, than taking the metals that we don't really need to take from the deep sea. We've got plenty of sources on the land to fulfill the needs for the foreseeable future. I, I, I find it hard to understand why we're just eagerly diving in with so little information about the real value of what's there. Well, well thank you, Sylvia. And you bring up a great point. I mean, it was just incredible seeing the life there where there's sharks at that depth and how life was formed and how only recently we discovered this. But you talked about some of the minerals that are being mined. And um, those minerals, there's four main minerals that are being sought after. Um, one is nickel, the second is cobalt, the third is uh, manganese, and the fourth is copper. Um, and so those are the minerals that are being sought after. And they have been found in this region of the Pacific as, um, what I understand, nodules the size of this computer mouse over here, or a potato. Um, what can you tell us about these nodules? How were they formed and how are they different from what was formed on land, nickel, copper, uh, cobalt on, on land? I have, we've got one uh, slide, I believe, that shows some of the, um, how the nodules are formed, usually around a biological element of some sort. It could be a piece of bone, it could be a tooth. Um, Shark's tooth. Yeah. So there, or whale tooth. <laughs> whales, pieces of whales. So there's always, a, there we go, there's a really good example of uh, these small nodules that are formed around fossilized shark's teeth. So we know how old sharks are in these fossil teeth. And, and here we're just seeing the beginnings of these nodules forming around them. So they they're precipitate very slowly. Biogenic. Yeah. They're, they're microbes, bacteria, archaea, the organisms that are responsible for taking the metals out of seawater. Mm -hmm. Seawater is a wonderful soup of, of ingredients. It's not just salt and water, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it takes this active precipitation by the action of the microbes. Wouldn't you, we like to know how they do it? And couldn't we harness their secrets if we don't just bulldoze our way through the ocean and disrupt the recipe that if we're, if we're careful, if we're thoughtful, what else can we find down there? Certainly some of the, the microbes that have been found around the vents turned out to be useful in the current. Yeah, um, absolutely. Some of them have been used in the, the in medical, in the pandemic and medical research uh, already. And we're seeing some of the ones from, even from like Yellowstone Park and, and now into the deep sea. For but testing. The, but the but the microbial world is is really so much more valuable to us in terms of what we can learn from it than basically what we how we can extract minerals from it and and the difference between mining on the land where we have some very robust uh, deposits already that could be mine take extracted in a more mindful way that are truly geologic in their formation versus biologic well some of the actually some of the formations that are now above ground were formed long That's ago. That's true, yeah. <laughs> used to be covered in water. <laughs> by the same process, some of the crusts, some of the vents. Um, but there's so much we don't know, but we do know that on land, we have some control. Mm -hmm. In the deep sea, first of all, who's watching? How do you monitor? On land, you can fly over, you can use all sorts of techniques, and we can govern with laws in the high seas, although in theory, there are supposed to be guidelines so that the environment does not suffer damage. How could you do what is being proposed and not suffer irreversible damage? It's, it's a conundrum. I don't see how it, it's realistic. If you're not going to, to damage the environment, then you're not going to mine. So mine we'll, we'll come to the governance. We'll come to the governance uh, in a moment. But I think you've made some important points here. It's worth mentioning. So the processes on land for these four minerals that we mentioned, nickel, cobalt, um, manganese, and, and copper, were produced by magma using geological processes. But here in these nodules, you know, hydrothermal vents to one side, but nodules where we start, we're talking about a biological process. So this is a product of biology. That's, that's and it's a living habitat. And the thing about those nodules is they're still alive. They look dead. I mean, a coral reef 
It looks like dead. Stony. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and in, in fact, the mineralized portion, of course, is not alive, but it's only there because of the microbial action. And one of these nodules the size of my fist would contain the entire history of humankind that it might have formed around a shark's tooth. How, how long ago did humans do our primate beginnings? Was it two million years ago? Or do you start merely 10,000 years ago when civilization began to come up? Whatever it is, these living rocks are not dead stones. They're living systems that form a habitat for a host of creatures that we're discovering anew for the first time. As scientists take the plunge and get down there to, with limited access, far less access than is being granted to the mining companies, they're amazing that how many new species, new forms of life are being found on every single dive. And it's, it's not the same in this place as it is in this place over here. Well, that's, and the nodules are different too. The nodules are very different. You know, we during that same cruise, our team observed things like you know megalodon teeth that were just starting to form crusts on them, a, a prehistoric whale fall, uh, you know, dead whale skeleton that's been on the bottom for thousands of years. Again, just forming the crusts on it just now. Um, and the thing we we really are concerned about, as you could see in the video, that most of these animals that are in this area are, uh, you know, they're bottom dwelling, they're not particularly fast, they, they kind of hang out in a particular area. And if you're coming through and you're, and you're creating this plume of sediment, either just from the, the um, action of a large mining vehicle going cross bottom and either kind of trying to suck up the things or um, winnow them out of the sediment in some kind of collection method uh, and extracting them back to the surface and then putting the the uh, sediment back over the side of the ship, um, mm -hmm. it's creating this massive plume and it doesn't just stay in one place. It's not as if you can just return it to the bottom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the so, so, the, so, the, so these are some important points. So we're saying, first of all, that um, the way that nodules are formed is very different from how um, minerals are formed on land. So maybe there should be different processes of regulation for that. And then um, second, we're now talking about you know, the actual techniques that are being used to mine uh, the minerals. So if one of the technical team could put the video on again that we started at the beginning so we can, we can talk through. Um, and by the way, thank you for the questions. Those in the audience, please feed through your questions and comments. I will turn to those questions uh, later. I, I do want to tease a few more of the points out of um, Liz and Sylvia first. So Liz, you mentioned that the, um, the mining companies will be extracting these, these nodules. That they claim that only between four centimeters or 15 centimeters of the top sediment will be disturbed. They'll be extracting this up. And I imagine these nodules are heavier than, than water. So maybe just talk a little bit about what you understand about the mining process. And also you mentioned sediment plumes. Just maybe explain what are sediment plumes and why we should be concerned about those sediment plumes. So when we saw there in the video, just as the ROV was, was going along very carefully, I and mean, this is a small ROV by you know most standards, it's a science class system, but you know it only weighs, well, it weighs less than 2000 pounds and it, it goes down discreetly picking up, um, if you could saw the, picking up the specimens. But um, even that will create some plume of sediment in the water column. And during the transects, we come back some hours later and it's still just kind of suspended there. It's a very um, low activity area in terms of um, what, you know, the movement of the water when it comes through. But there are bottom currents that come through. And if you're taking the sediment, or is it, maybe it's better equated to tailings from a mining operation and putting them back over the side of the ship, then it's going to be distributed throughout the entire water column. So it's not just impacting and kind of burying animals that live on the bottom, but it's going to impact all the planktonic creatures, the drifters, all those other life forms in the water column as it's kind of going back towards the bottom. Five miles of water. Five miles of water, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, that's a, that's a large it's impact. <laughs> and um, then there's horizontal as well. Yeah. And so even if you have areas that are set aside as sort of no-take zones or protected areas, there's nothing to say that a sediment plume won't sort of travel through those areas and also uh, impact the animals that you're trying to protect in a, you know, in an area that mind versus unmind, <laughs> so, so, so to speak. The, the value here is in marketing. You know, it's like selling shares in a, a treasure. That, that it's, it's the money is to be made and investors, whether they'll ever get a return is, is a question. It, first of all, 
the difficulty of operating is it's still really a challenge. And I've been following this since the late 1970s when Howard Hughes was out there. <laughs> True. It was a, yeah. um, an effort to be a cover story for the lost submarine, the Russian submarine, and the U.S. was was actively trying to recover the submarine, but they needed a cover story, and the cover story was Howard Hughes and his Glomar Challenger out there. Glomar Explorer. Yeah. Gl Glomar Explorer, yeah. uh, going out to recover, and, and the cover story was manganese nodules are out there. Let's go <laughs> get them. And it created this, this appetite, this belief that all you have to do is go down there and pluck them off the bottom. They're just sitting there. And if we don't get them, somebody else will. It's the high seas after mm -hmm. all, it's like the wild west. Mm -hmm. And now the governance issue that I, I know you're going to deal with this in future um, webinars, but I mean, it's, it's just frustrating to look from my perspective and see the incredible value of this intact old growth system that has never felt the bite of human activity before. We, yes, there's a rain of stuff that we put in the ocean that's everywhere, plastic and junk, but we've never undertaken, have not been able to do so in our entire history, not in the history of the world. The first time that this deep sea system has been access, accessible. And so the first thing we want to do is tear it up, chew it up, and spit out a few minerals instead of looking at the intact wonder that this place is and thinking, how do we, how do we protect it? Our lives are dependent on the natural systems that hold the planet steady. And we've done a terrible job of protecting the land and we haven't done a very good job of the ocean, but more of the ocean is intact now than any other place. Why would we, why would we do this when we don't have to? And so, and we, and reason and we, really, we... we really don't have to. And, and one of the other infuriating things is to see that some of the technologies that have been developed for, say, oil and gas extraction, um, you know, one of the ideas now as well, we don't need as much oil and gas because we're moving to electric vehicles. So um, let's repurpose some of those uh, technologies for bringing up these nodules. But guess what? Oil and gas is naturally buoyant. It wants to come to the surface. These are, these don't, these are heavy. <laughs> they don't want to come up a rise of pipe. <laughs> They're living rocks. They're living rocks. So it's, it's kind of crazy to think about how much energy are you going to expend in trying to suction these things up. Um, you know, gravity is not on your side and physics aren't on your side. It's, it's not, um, it's not a, a reasonable approach. This was a big discussion of conference that you attended in the UK. Right. A, a conference that was, you know, a very pricey conference so that scientists couldn't really afford to go, um, but, by the way. But in any event, it was a, a big discussion is how can we apply, you know, AI? How can we apply oil and gas technology? The riser system. It, the riser systems to, which work very well for a naturally buoyant material like, you know, oil that wants to come to the surface. Gas. Gas that wants to come to the surface and expands on the way up. But, but I mean, you know, a living rock. It's gonna take some energy. It's gonna take a lot of energy, a, a lot more energy really than trying to extract uh, oil, or, oil or gas. And it's, right. it's baffling. Right, so, so you know, even the, the mining techniques that are being used that, that, you know, there have to be a close scrutiny on the actual energy, not just the, the damage to, between land and the ocean floor, but also the energy emissions mm -hmm. and other processing that will be required for, for minerals Correct. from the ocean it's as well. It's not a green deal. You gotta look at the whole picture. I mean, you, you know, you have to think about all the energy that goes into the extraction process as, as part of the equation. And the disruption caused by the noise, by the light pollution that you have out in the open ocean where these operations are taking place. It's one thing to go out scientifically, discreetly and carefully with the objective of trying to understand what's going on. It's another thing to go out there with no regard really to those questions, but rather just how much can we get as fast as we can get it. Yes, we have to have guidelines to go by, but uh, what's frustrating is the definition of damage right now. It's being, well, perhaps you should explain, Nissan. I mean, this process is taking place as we speak, go back to the 70s, even through the 80s, where the, the guidelines were even before the United Nations 
developed the Deep Seabed Authority, the International Seabed Authority, that with the idea that you would protect the deep sea as well as to find a way, if possible, to, quote, exploit it, exploit it without causing damage. It's almost a contradiction in terms, the way we're currently going about. There may be ways to exploit the real value, understanding the living value, the value of the microbes that are there, the secrets that we might be able to extract from those sea cucumbers that, yeah. that some say, well, they're just sea cucumbers down there. Well, but look at the diversity of them and see how many different forms they take and, and even finding animals that live symbiotically with them, yeah. you know, in the gut system. And, and it, it's just a remarkable when we actually have the opportunity to go, to go down there and not just look at the animals on the seabed, but that whole host of life throughout the water column. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just an amazing place. And can't we just hit the pause button? You know, I'm among those who say, let's give it 10 years. Let's have a moratorium. Now, it may be in 10 years, a number of things. We may have find, found alternatives to cobalt, nickel, nickel, and lithium, and copper that are more efficient, more easily, uh, more readily available than these known metals, but also the rare earth metals and minerals that are also within the deep sea systems. But it's like building an economy based on unobtainium. <laughs> you know, yeah. The destruction involved in getting these metals is the cost of it to the living systems is so egregious that why would we do it if we can find alternatives? In 10 years, maybe we'll decide, look, it's the only thing, only way we have to go. Okay, we will give them our best shot, but give us time. Give us at least a decade to figure it out and help fund the science to get down there and really understand. Like, try to reason with a Neanderthal with a computer in his hands. Don't just use it as a tool to crush rocks. <laughs> Maybe there's something more important to that computer that you can, if you just give us time, we'll show you how important it is. Oh. So as a Neanderthal trying to um, click through questions at the same time, I'll turn to a couple of questions um, as we, we go through. Um, okay. Sergio Alfonso de Alba uh, Sanchez asks, you know, what would be the short-term impact on um, my, you know, of, of mining for life on land? But I think there's a deeper question over here because um, it sounds as if what we're mining for on land is very different in different regions. And Silva, you talked a little bit about governance. Um, when we, the seabed is in international territories. And when we look at the, at the planet where we have international territories, that is, um, you know, Antarctica or the Arctic, how are we thinking about, you know, extraction of minerals, which we know are extremely rich minerals in Antarctica and the Arctic. How have um, governance mechanisms been put in place there and what can we learn there for the, the deep seabed? Well, people around the world, nations around the world agreed more than half a century ago to not exploit Antarctica, that no military, no commercial development there. Yes, scientific bases, and that could change because they're the same interests that want to mine the deep sea or look at any living system, look at just at the earth as commodities. You know, there, there are pressures against maintaining these areas. And, Frankly, the Arctic is not as well protected as Antarctica, but there is an area right at the top of the world that is also high seas. It's not as big as the continent of Antarctica, but nonetheless, it's a place where by mutual agreement right now, there are some fishing constraints to not exploit the global commons at the top of the world. And right now the United Nations is moving with policies. This year, 2020, was to be a big year for the ocean, and it, it will be, for establishing large protected areas in the high seas by mutual agreement under the United Nations governance. But the deep sea, huh, when the law of the sea was crafted and the International Seabed Authority was developed, the idea that the sea floor, the bottom of the ocean, would be again, the common heritage of humankind, but that it would be governed by this international seabed authority, would have the, the jurisdiction, the ability to allow leases and 
either for exploration and ultimately for mining. And it's this summer, July, that 30 individuals, only three of them with any kind of science credentials and none of them with anything other than ind industrial exploitation at heart. And even Michael Lodge, who's the secretary for this, this International Seabed Authority, is convinced that the, his job is to exploit, find ways to effectively mine, and, and not looking at other values, not even putting that on the table as something like, what, what's happening to the carbon cycle as a result of tearing up the seafloor? How are these ancient systems, what are they doing? What's their role in holding the planet steady in terms of planetary chemistry? Those are the questions, among the questions that scientists are asking when we see these landers going down, looking at water chemistry, when you see the ROV down, who lives there? What, how do they live? Chemosynthesis, not photosynthesis, powers that system for the most part. And we're at a point in time when we have a choice. We have a choice now, but post July, those choices might be limited, very limited. So it sounds as if um, you know, we can do it. The question is, should we? do it and it sounds like the risk that you're talking about are not the no known risks to take the Donald Rumsfeld uh, quote but it's the unknown unknown risks and how do we govern that and it sounds as if in Antarctica and Arctic there have been new governance frameworks for the unknown unknown risks and that's something to be thinking about for the deep ocean. We, we can knock down the Washington Monument we have the power to do it but should we? <laughs> no <laughs> I think it's it's valuable in many ways to humans uh, there's so many things that we could do. We have the engineering capacity to destroy the world, should we choose to do so. But do we have the wisdom? Do we have the willingness to deploy our mighty powers so that we, we really can safeguard the world? Okay. Now that we know that that's, that's an obligation, it's, it's a choice, but really, why would we do otherwise? Why are we pour into the natural systems that keep us alive? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm going to try and get, take a few more questions so that we can get through the audience as well. So Jared asks, um, what's your response to the deep sea mining companies who claim that the impact on biodiversity and climate is much lower in the ocean relative to terrestrial mining of the same minerals? Nonsense. <laughs> All well, well, we really don't. We don't have enough knowledge to make that kind of statement. I mean, we well, spent, we know enough to know that we know the, enough to know better. Really. That the diversity is rich and we've known since the 1960s that these deep sea systems are enormously rich. You just have to understand that the little guys count and I'm not just talking about microbes, although certainly they do count. And finally we've got a wake up call of understanding that we have a biome that keeps us alive. Earth has a microbiome that keeps the whole planet alive. And the great majority of microbes and viruses and archaea are out there in the ocean. That's where 95% of the biosphere is. That's what keeps all of us alive. And everything on land really depends on a living, healthy ocean. It's become, getting that perspective and knowing that already we're seeing a decline in the ocean systems. Half the coral reefs gone in 50 years. 90% of many of the fish that we have we're gotten so good at extracting them, we need to get better at caring for them. Mm -hmm. And right across the board, it's the integrity of the natural systems that generate oxygen, take up carbon, drive planetary chemistry, keep us safe in a universe that is really unfriendly. And uh, we have the knowledge of why it matters. What we have a hard time getting through our minds right now is just because these, quotes resources are there, what's a resource today may not be so attractive tomorrow. There may be something that you kill in the process of getting what you think of as valuable today. Then you'll look back and say, what were we thinking? We can look at the rainforests and think, why didn't we do a better job while there still was time to safeguard more of those precious areas that have the diversity of life 
equivalent to what you have in the ocean in some ways, but the ocean is more diverse than anything on the land. You know, all of the major divisions of life that we know about, of animal life, they're out there in the ocean. Only about half of them occur with all of the land put together. And it, even in the deep sea, where exploration as deep as we're now looking at for mining began seriously, evaluation of what lives in the mud, they found in a place you can embrace with your arms a dozen phyla of these categories of life. We're saying crustacea, annelids, bryozoa, pogonophorans, you name the, these weird and wonderful creatures that create the fabric of life upon which all of us are dependent for our existence. And so let's turn to that, that fabric of life um, uh, question. Um, I, I see uh, Chris asked what is uh, being determined in July. So I'll just take that quickly. So in July, the um, International Seabed Authority um, has a vote that's going out on whether to allow um, uh, explo exploration licenses to be converted into exploitation licenses. So a piece of legislation uh, that will be passed and that will allow seabed mining companies to convert what's right now exploration, as Sylvia and Liz are saying, um, to actually commercial scale exploitation. Um, and what I just heard you say, Sylvia and Liz, is that if there's no urgency, if the claim is that we need these minerals for renewable energy, but we have more than sufficient on land and there's no urgency now, why don't we pause, pause for a few years, pause for as long as the, the science needs to understand. We're not saying indefinite, but let's understand first the scientific implications. So why is there a rush in July in three months time, um, especially with coronavirus? I'm not sure how much additional science we'll get <laughs> in that three months. But let me turn to about that fabric of life question. So I've got a question from Dirk and Natasha, and where they're, where they're asking about um, the use of um, living organisms for medical purposes or industrial purposes, pharmaceuticals. So maybe you could talk a little bit about you know, biomanufacturing and the biological revolution and how relevant some of that life could be used to, for, for the new economy that we're starting to see. Well, that's where we're at right now, beginning to really appreciate the opportunity that is open to us that we, we've just gradually begun to understand the, first of all, the importance of the microbiome in terms of the chemistry of the planet that keeps us alive. And it's in the last 50 years, largely, that this is beginning to be appreciated, not just by scientists, but the public at large. And if we can work with these little guys, the microbes, we already are doing so in terms of like manufacturing insulin. Well, you know, it's, that's evolved because we focused on that process, harnessing the power of microbes. But look around, the recipes for life are essentially, well, as big as our imagination. And we, we're, we're just on the beginning of the, 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 have to say the problem with putting a pause on deep sea mining now for whatever good reasons that we can come up with. Problem is that there are investors who put down quite a lot of money building machinery, investors who want a return, and they don't really seem to care about questions such as the, the person who just called in, you know, so what? We want our investment to pay off and we want it now. We're not interested in waiting 10 years, even though as far as society is concerned, it, it is really a good deal for them. It's, it's hard to say, look, we, we thought this was important because they, they, they uh, bought the marketing. The marketing, you're right. But you know, with the, with the microbes, um, and we know how how quickly uh, you know viruses and bacteria can can mutate. We're seeing it right now. We're seeing a lot of these uh, results of with the COVID nineteen and the different mutations it's taking on. Mm -hmm. But the opportunity to really spend time and look at some of these organisms, work with them, and work with them. Um, we they're have not a, the enemy. No, they're not. But you know, ninety nine percent of the time, it's because of ninety nine point nine percent of the time. It's because of things that we do that mm -hmm. that you know put put them into a. Uh, way you know into a situation that's bad for us disrupting the disrupting natural the systems. systems so it's 
So, so there's, there's the, the risks and we need to understand the biological risks and there's the opportunities of what, what we can discover with life as we move into this new kind of exactly. biomanufacturing world where there could be potential there. Um, I've got another question from um, a, a representative of the mining industry, Greg Stone. And Greg asked the question um, that uh, 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 seabed mining is believed to be the lightest touch of all deposits. Um, that the science shows that land-based um, minerals uh, produce more carbon dioxide. I believe um, an analysis showed that actually um, nodules from the seabed, uh, both manganese and cobalt, are more carbon intensive than land. So I think that's an interesting question. Um, and that uh, effectively he's claiming that land-based mining is more destructive than ocean-based mining is the, the nuts of his question. How do you respond to that, uh, Sylvia and Liz? Saying it doesn't make it so. You can say anything, but I look at the evidence and destroying a heretofore untouched system has a cost associated with it that can't be compared with what we're seeing happening on the land. On the land, you have the ability to monitor it and to change the policies that in some cases are not the best. Mining is nasty, dirty business. No matter period. where. <laughs> no matter where. And it just is. And we all benefit from the products that we're taking. We, we need to do a better job, among other things, of taking what we've already got and reusing it. I mean, the, the, everyone talks about the circular economy and those in the mining industry will poo-poo it and say, well, you know, that's only this much that you could ever, ever recover from what we've already taken. But, you know, if we really focus on it and make it a priority, in fact, mandate it, that you don't build a cell phone unless you can turn it back and build another cell phone out of the ingredients or an automobile or any of the, the things that have made our lives as prosperous and convenient as they are, why should computers just be thrown away? Why e shouldn't they be? Yeah, they shouldn't um, be e-waste. They should be e-or. <laughs> no, and, and you know. I, I take the point that right, right now we're, we're not where we should be in terms of building or structuring our economy because we haven't had to. We've had this mindset that there's always more. Let's just go to this other place. Let's keep taking and taking. But for sure, there is evidence, and I am confident that there is enough on the land to be taken with a lighter impact than anything that is now being put together to mine the deep sea. That, just because you can't see it, doesn't mean that it hasn't, isn't having an impact. It's under the cover of the ocean, so who's watching? And even if you were watching, what could you do about it once the law is in place, allowing this egregious behavior to take place. That's that's true, and you know the other piece of it is that we're seeing so many companies now are beginning to to wake up to the fact that they do need to do a better job, and we're seeing battery technology in particular that is being you know we're seeing more efficient, you know, more efficient we're in a longer uh, lifespan. You know, uh, some companies are on the quest to have the you know the million mile battery, <laughs> or the, and some of them are easily easily producing you know, 300 to 500,000 miles of service in an electric vehicle already. That's, and, where, our, our and that's, and that's where the effort and investment needs to be. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be focusing on the extractions. Like how do we work better and smarter with what we've got? And instead of, you know, trying to destroy um, living systems. Right. And I think that that's good. Sorry, go ahead. So yeah, then I'll, I'll come in. Just, I take seriously the, the message that the world is, earth is giving us and the ocean is giving us, the ocean is in trouble. That means we're in trouble. We should do everything we can to safeguard the systems that are intact, wherever they are. Whether it's a healthy coral reef, a healthy seagrass meadow, or a healthy deep sea system. You have to make a really, you know, airtight case that this is crucial to the existence of humankind to say, but actually, <laughs> what we're saying is it's crucial to the existence of humankind that we safeguard the places that are intact. The last bit of old growth forest, wherever it exists. 
that's our that should be our number one priority hold the planet steady don't degrade or destroy more than than is absolutely essential i don't see this as absolutely essential by any so, means and so that's interesting and you know one of the points i just want to pick up that you said earlier it's that you know just because you've said something doesn't mean it exists so maybe you could just talk a little bit about how the scientific process works as leading scientists yourself there's a lot of industry papers that are being put out but how much uh, industry or science has been peer-reviewed um, how much of the claims that are being made have really been transparently integrated by world-class scientists like yourself? So maybe share a little bit about how science works, how your work validated, and what you'd like to see um, done with the claims being made by the seabed mining industry. Well, it's called marketing. <laughs> uh, marketing. It's just, it's like selling the dream of, of, get rich by mining the deep sea uh, and, and that's what all the, some need to hear they 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 drink the kool-aid <laughs> they they buy into the fantasy there's great will and, and you look at the pictures and it's seductive you see these nodules on the sea floor and the the pitches we just have to go down and lightly scoop them off the ocean floor bring them back and again, the pitches, they're just loaded with all of the, the vital metals as compared to what you see on land where you get a fraction of what we can, we promise, we promise that what you'll get out of the deep sea. Anyway, I'm a scientist. Show me the evidence. I see the claims, but I don't see the backing of those claims. It just is like a... <laughs> used car salesman <laughs> believe me believe me it's what it is no so it sounds as if an, it... i've been watching this now as i say since well for 50 years almost 40 years 40 <laughs> years and it, it the message hasn't changed much it's just that now we have technology that enables us for the first time humans for the first time to access the deep sea Right. And, and you know, we are seeing uh, better access for scientists, but it's still extraordinarily limited and, um, expensive. and, ex and expensive. Uh, you know, and if you look at, I mean, we know what it costs to, to mount a scientific expedition to go out just for a short period of time. You know, it's, it runs quickly, uh, you know, into the millions of dollars uh, in ship time and personnel and equipment and so forth. So you really have to kind of think about what are these where's all that money and the marketing stuff coming uh, from the extraction side and from uh, investors who've been sold the dream. Yeah. And it's, yeah. And I, I mean, we need a lot more transparency and, and, uh, I so we need transparency on, on the funding for the science and where that's gone and what the results. And we've seen this in previous industries in the past, but it sounds as if, and I see Greg asked if and there could be an industry participation. I think what you're saying, Sylvia, is that we welcome um, you know, the industry to, to come on and we have a robust discussion uh, to actually understand what those claims are and what the scientific um, you know, backing should be. I'm getting reminded by the technical team um, that if any panelists um, or, 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 uh, or the audience wants to raise their hands, I think we can invite them in as well to ask questions. So please use the raise hand function and the technical team will help um, raise those questions. Um, and so I think if we turn to a few more um, questions, um, I'm trying to see. Um, yes, the, uh, the current, uh, there's a question um, from uh, Tasneem around the, um, the protection mechanism, the APEIs, which are these areas of um, protection. Um, do you believe that we have um, sufficient robustness uh, around the areas and you know, especially when you look at the Indian Ocean and the um, Atlantic Ocean, the hydrothermal vents? And I understand that there are other treaties being negotiated at the moment. There's this big convention on biodiversity that was going to set targets for the next 10 years. And then there's a treaty on high seas biodiversity that was going to look at how we protect the deep ocean. So what is your sense right now with um, where the, the robustness of our environmental protection legislation is? around seabed mining operations? Not good enough to protect the biodiversity that is there because in fact, it's patchy. Every place is somewhat different from every other place. And yes, there are some species that are found over a wide area, but those that are home buddies stay in one place for their entire existence 
Um, the Indian Ocean around hydrothermal vents has a unique set of organisms from those in the Atlantic. There's some that are comparable in some ways, but they're different. I mean, they're distinctly different and different from those in the Pacific. The miracle is that there is any continuity at all considering the distances involved, but mainly, <laughs> you know, it's a question of why would we demonstrate the need? I, none of this is of the unscathed areas, the places that are still in good shape. Why would we presume that it's more important to tear them up for short-term use than to hold them in the bank and let them do what they've been doing for hundreds of millions of years, holding the planet steady. Going back to the late 70s, I participated in the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and putting forth a, a, a recommendation that was approved about deep sea mining, saying that there should be stable reference zones, which is kind of what's happening now. Places, if deep sea mining is to proceed, let's at the very least try to identify places of equal merit, equal value, and not touch them because we don't know enough. Well, guess what? We still don't know enough. We don't know where in the deep sea would be the, the places that we should, you know, at all costs not disturb. Maybe it, the answer is, why should we dis disturb any of it if we don't absolutely have to for reasons that transcend 30 companies or 30, basically those represented by 30 individuals sitting around the table in Jamaica, the International Seabed Authority, making decisions on behalf of the whole world. It's the biggest land grab on the, in history we're talking yeah. about basically half of the world being decided by 30 individuals that, that with policies that will endure beyond my lifetime, your lifetime, the lifetime of our kids. We have a chance right now to say, put this, let's just stop. Just wait. We just give us a chance to think about the alternatives. Do we really need to dive into these heretofore untouched areas for short-term use that may just disappear in the next 10 years. The next, so, and we can't put it back once it's gone. You know, and, and you know, before we completely run out of time, yeah. <laughs> we, should, we should really talk further about, uh, you know, where, where we're going to be like in the next, 30 years and, and you know, this, this argument that's been coming along recently that if we have a moratorium right now, that there won't be any science happening out there, that, that, that like all the funding for science is tied to the industry and, and that whole argument. And we just really need to kind of refocus attention on the need to fund exploration versus exploitation. And or at so least that, explore first. Well, exploration to just, re so we really can start to understand these systems and um, get a much better sense of you know, the real value, the, the true value. Really put nature back on the balance sheet, or on the balance sheet for the first time. <laughs> so it doesn't get to be at all. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm just going to come in a little bit. So putting nature on the balance sheet because I'm looking at time and I'm looking at the question. So um, you know, to, to, to your point, um, Silvio, these are the areas that have been earmarked. In red is you know the mining zones, the green are the protection areas. But when you look at the Atlantic or the the Indian Ocean, it's effect we're effectively relying on industry self-regulation to determine those protection areas. Um, and so I think the, the point you're making <laughs> is um, how do we avoid, avoid those risks? Now, I've got a question about a moratorium um, over here. So you're asking about actions that can be taken. Um, and Kate asks, what can we do to help um, demand a moratorium on seabed mining until the science sufficiently advances? What, what are your thoughts on that? I'm sorry, what was the the, the question was, um, should, would, could, should we be considering a moratorium on commercial seabed mining? Yes. And what steps could any members of the audience take if that's a belief that you have, um, that we should be looking at a moratorium until science sufficiently advances? 
yes, I mean, that's, that's the plea, if you will, that I'm not alone in this. There's a large constituency out there. The, the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, mm -hmm. representing many thousands of individuals who are c as concerned as, as am I and more, but who knows about this, Nishan? It's not headline news. It's beginning to seep into the mainstream media. The New York Times occasionally has a piece about it, but it, when I say half the world, I'm talking about the high seas generally. Within the high seas, those lease areas are enormous, as you point out. In the clarion Clipperton zone, spreads across an area the size of, of this country, of the United States. These are not token areas, little places. They're enormous areas that are being targeted for exploitation. And who knows about it? And, and not only that, but it's really, ex it allows, or it's a mechanism that can allow a much larger country to come in and really exploit a small island nation. Really Which is get, happening. And yeah. they're getting really control of those small island nations. And they oh, really oh. deserve their autonomy and to really understand how valuable their resources are alive versus mind. That's within the, ex the exclusive economic zone of some of the small island countries. Mm -hmm. But they also have a voice in terms of the high seas. All of us do. But I mean, people, if they really understood that they have a vested interest in the high seas, in the area where the mining is taking place, that they might be upset, but all this is happening place in secret. Yeah. Very <laughs> guarded, very... Skullduggery. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, yeah, to, today's topic is about, yeah, the science. We're, we're running out of time. There's a lot of questions. Um, I, why don't I bring in Josh at this moment to talk how those who want to ask questions can get involved in further webinars and we'll have opportunities in the future to talk to Sylvia and Liz. So Josh, can you join us please and share around um, what the next steps will be for, for these seminars? Right. So thank you, everybody, for your involvement today, Dr. Sylvia Earl, Liz Taylor, Nishan uh, Dignarin. Thanks so much for your time here. I'll bring this information back if you want to be able to reach out uh, to find out more and uh, involve yourself in these conversations. Uh, so thank you to all of our colleagues, the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, uh, SaveTheHighSeas.org. High Seas Alliance uh, at highseasalliance.org. If you wish to donate or to help defend the deep ocean or learn more about seabed mining, please visit the websites above or also, of course, mission-blue.org or seabedmining.org and Ocean Elders uh, providing uh, channels through YouTube, on social and through the website. Uh, for now, Nishan, I want to toss it back over to you so that we can have any final comments from you. Uh, here we have our upcoming events that you can uh, reference for our participants. Wonderful. Well, with that, we've covered um, a lot of ground. Um, and uh, yeah, some of the takeaways for me is that we really need to think through the difference between land-based minerals and ocean-based minerals. It's clear from the science that we've heard from Sylvia and Liz that these are not the same minerals. These are not the same environmental landscapes. So we need radically new um, governance frameworks. And if there is no urgency for this, as we're hearing from the science, what is the need for us to be rushing through and making rash decisions that will have a catastrophic impact. Um, so I'm deeply grateful, Liz, Sylvia, for your time, for your insights. I want to leave the last words for, for you, Liz and Sylvia, um, for any t last takeaways. Go. Well, <laughs> I just, I really encourage people to, to be more involved, to help support uh, scientific exploration to these areas, and to really uh, think about the benefits of preserving large intact ecosystems. Our lives depend on it. Right on. So, I mean, I get it about the, the, the pitch that we need these metals, these minerals for our cell phones, for our computers, the technology that enables us to have this conversation, among other things. Mm -hmm. But we should be smart enough to look for alternatives, look for other ways to get from where we are to a better place. Unobtainium is not the answer. But we've gotten ourselves into this mindset that we have to have more, more, more of what has gotten us to where we are. Well, there are limits. Mm -hmm. And 
to look at the other values that transcend the short-term value of what those metals can bring to us. We need like more, a, more conscious consumerism, not just rampant consumerism. I can understand that Earth and the ocean in particular is in trouble. And so we're in trouble. We need to safeguard the ocean every way we can and find every way we can to not take more from the ocean, but rather to find the balance. Let's, <laughs> let's respect the ocean for what it gives us most importantly, which is our existence. Okay. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, with COVID-19 around the world, we hope that everybody listening continues to stay safe and is, I think, nothing more important than reminding ourselves on, you know, how profound our interaction is with this planet and how, how little we know about this planet. So we should take precautions. With that, thank you. Once again, thank you, everybody. Contact information on the screen if you'd like to reach out to join the conversation and keep the, this mission going. Uh, Dr. Sylvia Earl, Liz Taylor, Nishan Dignarin, thank you so much for your time today and holding these crucial conversations with us. Uh, Deep Sea Conversation Coalition, again, uh, save the high seas org. High Seas Alliance at highseasalliance.org. Uh, many thanks also, of course, Mission Blue, mission-blue.org, and seabedmining.org. Uh, this presentation and these conversations are brought to you by the Ocean Elders Organization, and we encourage you to follow uh, these conversations also on YouTube. You'll, you'll find the recording of today's session there shortly. You can reach out mytownhallquestion at gmail.com. Uh, and visit oceanelders.org. My name is Joshua Jones. I'm the founder of The Web Nerd, and we're happy to provide technical support for today's session. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today, and please don't miss out on our upcoming town halls. Really appreciate all of your time. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>